Thank you, Bill. Uh, we, we are still firm believers in the market, and only when the market begins to fail in selected areas that we need to introduce intervention to help it restore the balance. And once the balance has been restored, we'll return to status quo. So, thank you very much. Uh, good morning to you all. I'm indeed very pleased to join you for the annual Economic Freedom Network Asia Conference. I wish to uh, thank the Lion Rock Institute for inviting me to speak today, and I wish you all a very successful conference. The topic of <clears throat> welfare populism and economic freedom is, dare I say, a timely and interesting theme for this event, and also for Hong Kong. In a space of just <clears throat> four months or so, Hong Kong has sworn in a new chief executive and a new fourth-term administration of principal officials, and we have also elected a new and large legislative council. This is our most comprehensive period of political transition since 1997. Perhaps understandably, or perhaps I should put it less harshly, amid such huge changes the past four months, has not been all plain sailing for the new administration. Even the seemingly straightforward topic of a new OH living allowance, which simply serves to benefit those old people living in poverty in our community, has become the subject of heated debate. I'll come back to that a little later. <clears throat> Amid this change, we are firmly committed to retaining and enhancing Hong Kong's free market credentials. And on this subject, I would like to uh, thank the Fraser Institute for naming Hong Kong number one again in this latest Economic Freedom of the World report. In particular, I noted that this year's report recognizes our market-friendly regulations, our freedom to trade internationally, and the small size of our government. These are attributes that we do value deeply and these are the attributes that we shall continue to hold in high regard. So before I dive into the main theme of this conference, allow me to turn back the clock a little bit and look at a few cases that highlight the lessons that we should learn from countries where welfare populism we need to be the principal cause to the accumulation of sovereign debts has destroyed prosperity. Sovereign debts are nothing new. To many countries, sovereign debts are just part of the balance sheet in the overall budgeting process. But the consequences of prolonged debt financing have clouded the global economy actually since the turn of this century. It was just over a decade ago that Argentina has plunged into crisis. Argentina defaulted on its debt of 100 billion US dollars in 2001 the largest sovereign default in history. The situation has become somewhat stabilized after quite a few years, but not without massive social unrest and large-scale debt restructuring along the way. While the Argentine economy has generally recovered to a more healthy state now, the various key institutions still need to be enhanced and fortified further. So a decade on, the pain is still being felt. Currency control is still in place in Argentina. The official annual inflation rate in the country is set to be 10%, a figure provided by the Argentine government that considered to be unreliably low by the IMF. Economists suggest that the true figure should be closer to about 25% instead. Last month, interestingly, an Argentine Navy training ship was seized in Ghana at the request of a creditor who refused to restructure the loans on which Argentina defaulted in 2001. The Argentine government hesitated to send a state aircraft to bring the crew back for fear that the aircraft would also be empowered. So what a dilemma. Just a century ago, in the early 1900s, the GDP of Argentina actually ranked sixth in the world ahead of the USA. So how was the prosperity of Argentina destroyed. Some blame the welfare populism policies of the then Peron government, which was overly desperate to win the popularity contest. But is that overly simplistic? 
On the other side of the Atlantic, the pain today is shared by many Euro countries, uh, in particular Greece. Greece was once a story of sustainable economic success. Its GDP grew at an annual average rate of 5.2% for half a century, between 1929 and 1980. By comparison, Japan grew at about 4.9% during that entire period. For many years, the Aegean islands of Greece with their famous whitewashed blue dome chapels were the dream honeymoon destinations of newlyweds and the Moscow places for tourists from all over the world. Now the national debt of Greece is some 150% of their GDP. The unemployment rate in July this year was over 25%. Street riots are becoming routine. Tourists hesitate to go to Greece because they fear that the hotels that they reserve may be out of business by the time they arrive. Professor Aristides Hatsis of the University of Athens considers that the Greek crisis today and the destruction of the country's prosperity have their roots in irresponsible public spending between 1981 and 2009, when political parties competed to offer populist welfare policies. And they step the full story. Similar, similar overspending of governments on welfare programs has been identified by many and others as the main cause for unrestricted escalation of the national debts in Spain, in Italy, and Portugal, leading to the crisis in these countries today. That said, I've also read different analysis by respectable commentators who have eloquently articulated that other causes instead of welfare spending, are the true culprits of the crisis today. I'm not an expert in the history and social, economic, and political dynamics of these countries, and so I shall refrain from making a judgment on how or whether welfare populism has indeed destroyed the prosperity of these countries. But what is clear to me, though, is that the painful situations in which our Western friends are now stuck should be alarming enough to all of us, especially for public administrators who are responsible for public finance, including myself. As the custodian of the community's purse, we must tread really prudently as a general rule in making any long-term financial commitment because any sign of trouble will not usually surface in the near term. The burden is usually borne by future generations. And by that time, it will almost be politically impossible to revert the thousand-year pain. But please don't get me wrong. I'm not against helping those in need. I believe that members of the community should look after one another, just like members of the family do. How do brothers and sisters look after one another? When everyone is doing fine, they can take care of themselves. But when a member is in need, other siblings contribute according to their respective capability, and they would pool resources to help the one in need. I believe that the same principle should also apply to welfare. Welfare should benefit those in need, first and foremost. It should be within the capability of the community as a whole. And moreover, welfare should also provide incentives to encourage and to enable the recipients of assistance to help themselves. So now, back to our proposed new OH living allowance. This proposal has been a subject of fierce debate with the Legislative Council recently. The allowance is meant to help elderly people living in poverty, as I mentioned earlier. I don't intend to reiterate once again the pros and cons of introducing the allowance because that has been discussed at nauseam over the past few weeks. What should be apparent to everyone, though, is the community's consensus to provide more support to our senior citizens who lack the resources to meet their living expenses. But some members of the legislature continue to advocate that all elderly people in our community, regardless of their state of wealth, should receive the allowance as of right and insist that it should not be means tested. Some even go as far as suggesting that the allowance should be the first step to a universal retirement protection scheme for all, 
which is another question altogether, and which I think personally is a really slippery slope on which for us to embark. I just agree with this populist view that some of our legislators are advocating. When the right of one member of the community becomes an obligation, a burden for another, that right cannot be absolute. It has to be conditional, as in the case of our old age living allowance on the means test. I believe that any welfare program should be affordable now and without placing too heavy a burden on future generations. Such programs should also be sustainable without depleting the community's resources for other equally important programs. Abiding by these principles, however, is not as easy as one may think. Politicians worldwide are often tempted to introduce welfare measures to score short-term kudos, but the costs will often only become evident in the future. So we must stay alert to these practices. In the introduction of After the Welfare State, a very good book that was edited by Dr. Tom G. Palmer, Senior Fellow and Director of Cato University, he reminded us that we should review from time to time among other things, one, whether current welfare state systems are unsustainable, and two, whether politicians have responded to incentives to promise and citizens to demand much more than can be delivered. There is a popular saying which says, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. A person in need is not necessarily someone who is incapable. With the right incentive and the right support, he can contribute positively to his own well-being. The working poor, the single parent families, the disabled, and other disadvantaged groups can escape poverty more easily if they can participate in employment and earn an income. I believe that we should encourage and enable them to work whenever possible by providing the necessary assistance, such as traveling allowance, or child care services, or free meals for the children, and whatnot. In the words of Professor Anthony Giddens, the former director of the London School of Economics, he said, this will, and I quote, allow individuals and groups to make things happen, rather than have things happen to them, end quote. <coughs> Passive maintenance should be a fallback for those who cannot possibly work, such as the elderly living in poverty or the severely disabled living the traditional wisdom to resolve the poverty problem is to distribute resources and opportunities from the better off to the vulnerable groups through the application of taxes and welfare policies. Another school of thought is to resolve the problem through economic growth, allowing wealth generated to trickle down to the less well-off sectors of the community. I don't believe that either approach on its own will resolve this complex issue in the world that we live in now. We need both. Over-reliance on redistribution policies often run the risk of unduly escalating public expenditure, creating moral hazards of welfare dependency, and discouraging economic growth. Practices in most capitalist economies, on the other hand, have shown that those who are better off have tended to keep most of the benefits of economic growth leaving very little to be shared among the less well off. So we need a good balance of both distribution and growth strategies. And we need what Dr. Jim Yong Kim, the new American president of the World Bank, what he called the dual track of creating wealth and reducing poverty. In drawing up my next annual budget, which will be delivered at the end of February next year, I shall continue to keep expenditure within the limit of revenue Thanks to our adherence to fiscal discipline and keeping a small government, Hong Kong has been able to accumulate a more fiscal surplus. This has provided the government with the necessary resources to create favorable conditions for economic development and to assist enterprises and people in need at all times. In the three fiscal years from 2008-09 to 2010-11, when I was the financial secretary in the last administration, we were able to implement a package of fiscal stimulus, job creation, and relief measures worth nearly $110 million 
to help the community counter the headwinds generated by global financial tsunami. The current strength of our domestic sector, despite gloomy conditions in major Western economies, is, I think, at least partly a testimony of the appropriateness of these measures. We have been saving for a long time for these rainy days. And fortunate for us, we in Hong Kong have been spared the devastating effects of the storm that is creating chaos around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I can assure you that Hong Kong will continue to exercise fiscal prudence in the management of our public resources for three very good reasons. First, because this is a requirement described in our constitution, the basic law. Second, because a lack of fiscal prudence has been a major contributory factor in sovereign debt crisis in Europe and elsewhere, and that should have taught us a lesson or two. And the third lesson, uh, the third reason is that prudent management of resources, including financial resources, is actually ingrained in the Asian culture. It is part of our value system that has served our communities and our region well, not least during the recent global financial crisis. As we consider lessons that need to be learned from the financial tsunami, allow me to share with you at this point this simple kind of folksy down-to-earth philosophy that should work for individuals and governments alike. Here it goes. Not to spend more than we can, not to borrow more than we can repay, and help each other to the best of our ability, but never beyond. Thank you. Thank you very much, Financial Secretary. Uh, if you could please stay on stage. We'd like to welcome uh, the guests of honor previously introduced, in addition to the Executive Director of the Lion Rock Institute, Peter Wong, and they would like to present you with this year's uh, Economic Freedom of the World report or reading. We'll uh, have a little bit more of the music to uh, accompany your photos. That is so, so appropriate. And I forgot to put the end of my story on about the 2005 uh, WTO meetings. I said, John Sung was our friend from then on. He did make arrangements for us to have our protest, and he was able to help us to get the message of free trade again. So once again, let's thank our guest of honor and speaker today, the Financial Secretary of Hong Kong, Mr. John Sung.